Well, we're looking at Matthew chapter 3 this morning, or to begin with, and I want to begin by focusing on verse 17, the last verse of that passage we've just heard. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Today, as we've already been told, um, we are concentrating on the baptism of Jesus Christ as this epiphany season unfolds. The moment when Jesus' own identity and mission was revealed. When the four evangelists wrote down what they thought people needed to know about Jesus, they all included an account of his baptism, though with some subtle differences. Luke, for example, is the only one to mention that the revelation of Jesus' true identity came to him while he was praying. Matthew, whose account we have just heard, is the only one to record John's reluctance to baptize Jesus, and Jesus' slightly strange response, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. As we shall see as we follow the lectionary readings for Matthew's gospel this, this year, Matthew loves to draw attention to the ways in which Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Prophecy is the declaration of God's will, and righteousness is the doing of God's will. From the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Matthew wants us to see in Jesus' baptism a sign of his complete and proper fulfillment of messianic prophecy in utter obedience to God's will. The terms of the declaration, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased, there are echoes of the passage we read from Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. In Mark and Luke, who put the declaration into the second person, you are my son, the beloved, there is a further echo of Psalm 2. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Psalm 2 is one of the so-called royal psalms. It speaks of God as a king dispensing judgment in the exercise of his mighty power, sweeping aside those who may have conspired against him. So we have in these few words of commissioning a rich tapestry of references to Christ as servant, Christ as son of God, Christ as king and judge. And when the Spirit of God descends on Jesus to strengthen and empower him in all these roles, it does so with the same almighty power that hovered over creation, driving him into the wilderness to come to terms with the implications of such dramatic revelation. In Acts chapter 10, we are introduced to Cornelius, he was a Gentile, a centurion in the Italian cohort of the Roman army of occupation. He was a good man who, like so many people today, had a sense of God without quite knowing what that meant. In Luke's account of the development of the early church, Cornelius helps Peter to make the groundbreaking discovery that the gospel to which he has already borne such powerful witness among his own Jewish people is offered on the same terms to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. As he prays, Peter dreams of a sheet full of all kinds of birds and animals, which he is invited to kill and eat. When he protests that as a good Jew he cannot eat such food, he has shown the same dream again three times and senses that God is trying to tell him something. It is at this moment that messengers come from Cornelius, who has been prompted by a vision to send for Peter to tell his story. 
When he arrives, Peter has no hesitation in entering Cornelius' house, explaining that God has taught him by that dream not to regard anyone as profane or unclean. God's love reaches out to us all, whatever our race or religion, our color or our sexuality. And in our reading, our second reading, we take up the story when Peter says, Peter declares, God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So Jesus, Cornelius, and Peter, three very different people, but all three laid themselves open by prayer and worship to the activity of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not need John's baptism of cleansing for the forgiveness of sins, but by his baptism, he identified himself utterly, not just with the pilgrims who had flocked to John in the desert, but with all humanity in our weakness and sinfulness and in our search for God. As Jesus laid himself open to God in prayer, the Spirit descended on him with great power to strengthen him for the tasks which lay ahead, driving him into the wilderness to reflect more fully on the nature of the mission to which he was called. Cornelius was at prayer when he saw that vision of an angel telling him to send messengers to Joppa to find Peter and bring him back to Caesarea. Peter had been praying when the messengers from Cornelius arrived. And when he gets to Cornelius' house, Cornelius welcomes him with the words, so now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. Great things happen when we open our hearts to God in prayer. Jesus was moved to embark on his public ministry, to set out as healer and teacher on the road that would lead eventually to the cross of Calvary. Cornelius was moved to get in touch with Peter, as you or I might be moved to visit someone or to make a phone call. Peter was moved to change a tenet of his faith, a firmly held conviction. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to whose promptings we open ourselves in prayer and worship, each one of them was moved to do something which God could use to carry forward his plan to reach out in love to all his children all over the world. Like Cornelius and his household, we are here this morning in the presence of God to open our hearts to whatever the Spirit has to say to us. And like Peter, we are witnesses. We know how our prayers have been answered. We know how we have been guided through life. We know how the love of God has reached out to us both to share our joys and to comfort us in times of of great distress. Oh yes, it's a risky business. It may change the course of our lives. But if we open our hearts to God in prayer, as Jesus, Peter, and Cornelius all did, we shall, like them, be shown what to do or say. And like them, we shall also be given the strength of the Holy Spirit to do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.